All right. Um, we're going to go into looking at concrete foundation risks after that excellent pre presentation on um, structural considerations that was just done. Um, next slide. Um, the learning objectives for this uh, presentation will be to identify key geologic foundation potential failure modes, uh, identify the foundation discontinuities, and discuss how they relate to the foundation slide stability. And then discuss key factors for foundation slide stability. So, um, geotechnical or foundation potential failure modes include um, sliding along weak planes in the foundation or the concrete rock contact, um, rock wedge uh, failures where you have adversely oriented discontinuities in the dam foundation that daylight downstream. Is there an echo? Uh, do you guys hear me okay? You sound fine. Tom. Okay. Um, and then, it, then there's a failure through the rock abutment mass, um, which would cause the, the concrete to slide and have a failure. Then you have uh, irregular or differential deformation on um, the abutment leading to seagrass concentration that exceeds the structural capacity of the concrete or the rock, which leads to failure. And then you have failed drains, uh, which increase uplift pressures, which can lead to movement of a block or rock wedge. And then you can have uh, solution features in um, first. So... Some of the key potential failure modes um, include erosion and scour for uh, some of the spillway structures, uh, undermining and headward erosion due to spillway failure, uh, weak foundation materials, and blowout of the abutment rock due to pressurized outlet or tunnel or penstock. And land sliding into a reservoir or abutment deformations, and that, that I think we'll be covering later on. Next. So this should be the um, a list of the percentages of failures in foundation for concrete dams. It should say about 53%. But I'm thinking on some of the overtopping ones, uh, those might be included in that foundation assessment because uh, most of the overtopping failures uh, resulted from probably foundation or erosion or undermining. So the main point is, is that it's exceedingly high that most of the concrete issues are in the foundation. So we're going to go into some of the case studies here which is the next slide. Um, there are a number of uh, notable failures of concrete structures that which we, we should attempt to learn from and understand so these triggering mechanisms, conditions, and concepts can be applied to our assessment during the risk assessment, but also during the design of these structures. And here's some of the notable ones. Uh, Austin Dam in Texas, early 1900s, sliding on the foundation. We have Bayless Dam, uh, early 1900s, also foundation sliding in, in Pennsylvania. And Francis Dam in California, above deformation and failure. Um, Mount East Dam in France, E Block failure. And then Camara Dam in Brazil, where he had a erosion, um, leading to uh, reservoir release. So next slide. Um, the case study here is the uh, LP set dam in France. Um, it was 217 feet high. Um, it was a, a series of rainstorms filled the reservoir very quickly in the late fall of 1959. 
And on December 2nd, 1959, the dam collapsed. <laughs> The flood wave caused a total destruction along 11 kilometers to the Mediterranean Sea, and the number of deaths attributed to failure was 421. And you can see here on this slide, uh, the first slide, the, the geology. Uh, the right abutment was a massive gneiss. Uh, the left abutment was fresh to altered, sheared, bulk shifts. Uh, the Shear zones are key in this assessment, as well as the shift foliation. Um, the water test showed the right abutment was tight, um, but there were numerous um, persistent faults in the left abutment, and you can see the orientations in the right slide. Next. So we should be on, um, and then this shows the wedge failure and the orientation, and then the uh, the vector uplift forces. So um, in the top right, you see the orientation of the two primary shear zones that created the wedge. You can see the side section of this illustration in the lower left. And then on the right, you can see a topographic angle of it um, illustrating the orientation of the shear zone as well as the abutment and um, dam orientation. Um, so what most likely happened and, um, is that um, the failure was caused by sliding and slipping on the upstream dipping fault plane that formed the rock block in the left abutment. The large the forces developed on the upstream foliation shear. The stresses generated in the rock by the arch thrust extended to great depth in the left abutment due to the orientation of the fault. This decreased the rock permeability and flow in the left abutment. Um, the tensile and shear stresses on the upstream phase opened up the shear foliation allowing water pressures to easily penetrate to great depth. And the clay materials along the foliation shear created a natural dam in the foundation. As the reservoir's water rose, the loading increased until the rock block began to move. The arch tried to redistribute the load onto the thrust box, but under the extreme overload, the thrust block moved about 2.6 feet downstream. And separate in the wing wall. Without anywhere to transfer the load, the entire left side of the dam lifted and rotated downstream, causing the dam to rupture. So it's pretty, pretty dynamic failure. Um, a critical point to note here is that this dam did not have a break or any lines of defense for So, um, what Questions posed by the next slide. Questions posed by the uh, failure. Can similar foundation deformations be triggered by high earthquake loading? You know, could this failure mechanism rupture through poor rock mass? Or would this would have this occurred if foundation drains were installed? So um those were the lessons learned carried forward from this dam failure. So now we're going to move into um, discontinuity and potential failure mode and rock blocks. With, um, perhaps the most critical area for evaluating the foundation of concrete dams has to do with sliding along um, adversely oriented geologic discontinuities within the abutment or foundation. You know, many times you need to have about three different continuous planes to intersect to develop a wedge. Um, this basically shows dramatically how this would occur, and the forces typically need to be considered. So we have the uh, wedge formed by three different planes here. You have the... Uh, Forces illustrated by the different vectors here, uplift one, uplift two, uplift three, the dance force. You have the continuity of the joints or combination of joints. 
And then you have a line of intersection where it's going to be released or daylight downstream. Okay. Uh, next slide. So the foundation red uh, wedge removability criteria um, gets into the the uh, geometry of the sliding and the kin kinematic removability of the foundation rock or wedge. It depends on the loading vectors, the static and hydraulic and seismic loads and the direction of sliding. It depends on the shear strength, D and feed of the base of the slide plane, and, and it must be overcome by the loading. Uh, it, it becomes uh, the configure the foundation of the excavated surface and the downstream top of rock topography. Um, one thing to note, uh, the configuration of the foundation and excavation surface, that, that's really important. Um, because in Dwarshak Dam, they excavated a lot of the shear zones to such a depth that it would create a significant wedge to move, and they backfilled it with concrete, so it made it uh, much tougher to move. So, identifying a lot of these things um, early in the design can help you develop uh, uh, protection measures during, um, during design and construction. Uh, next slide. So it's really important to betray the geologic, geologic information on plan maps, sections, profiles, and structural contour maps. The geometry is well understood and appropriate evaluations and calculations can be made. Um, you really need to portray the three-dimensionality of these systems. And the best way to do it is with uh, these kinds of maps. You can see the cross section on the right, and then the plan view with the uh, stereo net projections on the left. So um, these are I find these very important and uh, critical when trying to analyze these and convey its geometry of these wedges to um, multiple people. Another critical source of information is um, construction photos. Um, with construction photos, you can see, especially if they're doing blasting, you can see what structure, what geologic um, joints are controlling the excavation during blasting. You can see how continuous they are, and then you can see the progress, how they control the excavation as you, you know adapt the abutment for the new structure. Uh, a curious note on this photo here um, for construction photos is the, uh, you can see that they're using the old abutment here on the right. <laughs> the old abutment of, a, of the concrete dam to build a newer one. You can see the platforms here. Um, in the center is the old dam and then further downstream is the new one. I just thought that was interesting. Um, uh, next slide. This is a uh, discontinuity and scale effect. Um, and many times when you're trying to figure out a lot of these uh, roughness features and stuff like that, you, you do a lot of samples and testing. And sometimes we do small scale rough samples, tend to overestimate the strength. Uh, saw cuts typically underestimate the strength just because it's smoother than what you would see in nature. Um, what we what what is best is to test actual joints and subtract the roughness, the dilatation angle by measuring the horizontal and vertical displacements to obtain the basic Then you have to add in large scale field roughness measurements from an outcrop. Um, a phenomenon that is typically overlooked um, Concern scale effects for rough joints or discontinuities. Um, Bandis and Barton tested large rough scale joint specimens in direct shear, and then they cut up the specimen to smaller and smaller specimens and repeated the test. Um, you can see this on the right in the figure. Um, as the uh, average strength increased, as the sample got smaller. This is because large scale and small scale roughness was not engaged as a sample. 
dilitates along the large scale roughness upon shearing. As the sample becomes smaller, the small scale roughness comes into play and dominates the depth of strength found. So, the typical solution has been to use saw cuts to remove the small scale asperities, but this has been found um, to result in an underestimation of the basic perfect angle because of polishing and uh, uh, natural grain removal of the granules granularity between the joint wall contacts of the and just damage during the cutting process. You get a lower strength. The alternative is to remove um, larger and have larger test samples done, but uh, that tends to be a lot more expensive. So now we'll get into the uh, foundation uplift. Next slide. And uplift pressures that we should consider. Um, typically, you want to develop a uh, potentiomatic surface of the groundwater contours to understand the groundwater conditions under the structure. And you have to evaluate your instrumentation data, plot the most likely uplift curves relative to theoretical uplift, 100%, and then project the relationships to the reservoir and elevations of concern. Uh, you know, if it's at the toe or where your block of concerns are. And then, and then evaluate the area of the block planes and calculate the total of the forces. We'll have a couple slides to illustrate this. Um, without, um, so yeah, there. So what you want to develop is a um, pressure contour map under the uh, under your dam. And you have to make sure that the uh, pressures are portrayed within our uniform flow or seepage zone. And then you have to, you may need to do separate diagrams to do confined aquifers, et cetera. So you might have a very complex foundation hydraulic um, regime. So you're going to have to work with seepage models um, and uplift pressures and a lot of instrumentation to figure it out. Next slide. Um, the effects of foundation drains uh, should not be overstated. The depth of the drain should be about 40% of the hydraulic height. That's typically a rule of thumb for um, drain design. Drains must be cleaned and have a, uh, an open M schedule that is uh, maintained. Uh, the um, USBR study found that two-thirds or 66% of the drain efficiency is observed in the majority of their inventory, um, which is good. The caveat is they have been fully loaded and they have a, a good data history. Um, in many cases, our dams are not fully loaded um, unless they're like a power generation dam. And, and many of those have seasonal changes, so they may not see a full PFM load ever in their life. So we must be diligent about maintaining and cleaning our um, our, our uh, drains, and you know, keeping it a a a, uh, a note on the chemistry, pH conditions, and uh, just general condition of the dam drains. You can see this on the next slide. You can get plug foundation drains, which need cleaning. Um, you can see the one on the left. You have uh, an iron like. Iron clock or iron um, biota. They can they can clog up the efficiency of your drain just with um, you know bacterial accumulation, iron bacteria. And then on the right, you can see uh, calcium carbonate or um, you know a calcium carbonate accumulation in the drain, and this can just literally block up all the all your all your uh, open crack or or joints in your drain cavity so you get back So um, you can usually clean these out with uh, the use of pressure, but not too high a pressure and chemical application. It really depends on the chemistry and, and your individual drain construction. Um, that should be looked at closely before you just 
You can see one of the apparatus in the upper right hand corner that does it. It, it has multiple ports on it. It'll go up and down and you can pack it off or, and, and sometimes you can do uh, a mechanical brush cleaning as well. It really depends on the depth of, and the scope of your problem with regards to your drains. But they have to be cleaned and maintained and evaluated during their operation uh, with a lot of your instrumentation. The, what the effects of your foundation drains do and maintenance does, you can actually see some of the uh, effects with these illustrations here. You can see uplift and loading before uh, maintenance and then right after maintenance, the line drops down. Uplift, the uplift after maintenance considerably lower. Before and after drain rehab, you can see the red as in the uplift pressure is measured before the drain rehab and the blue, you can see the line, it drops after rehab. And then before and after drain, drain rehab at a toe within a, you know, different one of the example there. So that gives you an example of how effective drains are and uh, maintaining them in reducing uh, uplift pressures within concrete structures. So grout effectiveness and grout curtain. Next slide. People um, often find they're very effective in reducing foundation water pressures and cutoffs in in um, dam foundations, but um, ninety percent of the flow may travel through ten percent of the foundation continuity. And in many of these old dams, a lot of these grout curtains are only single line, sometimes double line, maybe triple line. A lot of the new design grout curtains are sometimes you know five lane. Um, with a lot of different balanced grout chemistries um, that were much more advanced than, say, the uh, water cement ratio in the 50s and 60s. That didn't have additives to keep them balanced and stable for, you know, building and traveling of long distance. Um, if you're going to count on a grout curtain to cut off or reduce pressures, you must have to, ver you have to verify that with measure measurements. And on the right, you can see um, there was no real pressure drop across the cutoff um, trench grout curtain in this illustration. The uh, pressure gradient is pretty much seen as a straight line <laughs> upstream and downstream thermometer measurements. That's mainly because the grout only probably travels through 10% of the rock mass because it, it wants to go where it's where the, m most of the flow is flowing, and it also radiates out in a three-dimensional manner, so it may not go in every single crack or um, discontinuity in the rock, so you don't achieve full cutoff. Um, special con um, consideration to be given when grouting under full reservoir head. Uh, several dams have shown that the grout tends to flow downstream under the flowing water and, and sets back up downstream rather than where you want it to be. Um, this can actually create a situation for foundation water pressure standpoint. Go to the next slide. Uh, rock mass modulus consideration. Uh, or the foundation rock mass modulus. Um, that can be determined in several ways. You can do it by in situ testing um, or putting in instrumentation. Um, or you can use a more qualitative measure by using rock mass rating systems and using empirical formulas to derive it as well. Um, so here, the, the, this is the uh, three rock mass and characterization um, parameters that are typically used to generate the rock mass modulus. You have RMR, um, which usually looks at the uniaxial compressor strength, the RQD, or rock quality designation, the spacing of the various, various discontinuity, um, you know, widely spaced, closely spaced, um, you know, very closely spaced. Then the condition of those uh, discontinuities, rough, smooth, swing inside, plate filled, tight, um, and then 
aperture, um, and then the groundwater conditions and the orientation of the discontinuity. Uh, Q, the Q um, rock mass quality index is a little different in that it, um, it, it looks at the same parameters, calls them a slightly different thing, and then you have a, a stress reduction fraction, the SRF. But typically, you're, you're, you're evaluating many of the same parameters just slightly differently. And then you have the geologic strength index, which is uh, uh, on the far right. And um, that is really good at utilizing low strength rocks and um, clay like or soil like rock conditions. But it can also do a wide range. But if that has that is I use I've used that in the past for more soil like rock conditions. Um, next slide. So the uh, foundation modulus can be determined from empirical relationships, in situ testing, in situ testing, or uh, calibration measured through deformations. The, um, in two cases where jacking tests were performed before and after grouting on Davis Dam and Auburn Dam, there was virtually no change in the rock mass modulus and no increase from rock grout uh, from grouting. And that's probably because um, it, you didn't get a uniform coverage, so you it, it, you, it, you didn't. See it. Also, from uh, Starting with thinner grout mixes may also have resulted in relatively deformable grout in some cases as well. Typically, they like to start with a thin grout to move out and spread out into the formation, and then they stick it up. But um, you know, the properties may may not be there to really change the rock the mo rock mo mass modulus. Next slide. So we should be on. Uh, Foundation rock mass modulus continued. Typically, a stiffer foundation modulus is more conservative to a structural response. Um, too low of a foundation modulus can over dampen the system for dynamic calculation. So it's not conservative. A low value is not conservative. You should perform sensitivity studies to see what the differences are in respect to the foundation load and strength distribution between the uh, foundation rock and the different um, concrete monoliths. A for seismic analysis, we usually are interested in the stiffness modulus of the foundation to support and dissipate dam loads, dynamic rock structure interaction and modeling, and how earthquake waves propagate from the foundation into the dam. When uh, mass is included in the dynamic analysis of a concrete dam, the ratio of the concrete modulus to the foundation modulus can have a big influence on the radiation and dampness of the system. When the foundation modulus is small compared to the concrete modulus, excessive radiation dampening can result. Therefore, the calibration of a finite element modulus shaking test can be useful for critical dynamic analysis. Um, the foundation modulus and other parameters are varied until the calculated natural frequencies match the measured frequency. This um, slide also shows the factor of safety calculations for three foundation blocks. So in the foundation of a thick arch dam formed by the upstream shallow dip embedding plane discontinuity. You can see there block B on the left button, block E, and block F. Um, the foundation consisted of a variable foundation rock units and modulus values, with stiff assumptions being roughly twice the soft assumptions. As, can be, as you can see, the lower factors of safety were calculated for the stiffer foundation modulus. So the dam deflects more and additional load goes into the arch action, which has a stabling effect by putting more normal stress across the structure the slide planes. This can make a big difference if the factors of safety were low or calculating the probabilities of the factor of safety is less than one. So now we're gonna get into like um multi block system so next slide. So typically um with multi block systems we do a two D analysis. 
Um, unless the passive block is very thin, shearing through the passive rock mass is likely. Unless the rock mass is material or there is an adversely orientated joint or discontinuity. And you can see the uh, example here. The uh, the forces involved in a passive system or sliding failure. Um, you have the active block uplift. You have the gravity of the structure down. Um, you can see the orientation of the passive block and then where you might have to shear to release it. You have to have a discontinuity to release it. Um, there, there must be shearing along a near vertical feature between the active and passive block. Uh, the results are highly sensitive to assumed inner block forces, the angle phase, and the multi block analysis. Elements or discontinuity, dynamic deformation analysis evaluations are more appropriate to account for interlocking forces and their orientations. So, um, many times when we're doing a quick two block, analysis, we don't evaluate the side friction angles and the 3D forces could be considerable in, uh, in a sliding block failure. Um, in addition, for a passive block to move, shearing must occur along boundaries between the active and passive block. Unless there's a near vertical joint or discontinuity at this location, this is unlikely. And the calculated factor of safety is typically sensitive to the inclination angles assumed for the inner block force. At the limited equilibrium, this should approach the friction angle of the inner block plane. It is usually taken as a horizontal, which may be overly conserved in some cases. It changes the earthquake loading, which makes it more difficult to track. So, that is that. Next slide. So, many times we do uh, 3D model construction um, and finite and model and for a class model analysis. Sometimes they're primarily for visualization purposes, but any which way they're used, they're very expensive and take a significant amount of time and money to develop. Generally, um, you can't perform the analysis on the, um, generally cannot perform any analysis of the model and the possibility of geometry parameters. However, it can be hugely valuable to communicate difficulty to E3D systems. Um, so many times you can't really portray all the geologic features in the model, but you could, you know, develop your main shear planes and and planes of weakness that are really the failure. So those would be really good to illustrate and uh, for the evaluation of the modeling as well as to illustrate to all parties how the failure is occurring. So my, the last note is 3D models look nice and are cool but are often quite expensive and don't actually help solve the problem. Just because some folks can't see or understand stereo nets doesn't mean they're not a valuable method for analyzing 3D web stability. Basically, you can do all this on a, on, in stereo nets and don't have to develop the 3D model construction. So, uncoupled analysis. And these are looking at rock wedges um, through programs and vector analysis, uh, vector analysis for strength balancing spreadsheets. You can also use rigid 3D equilibrium programs developed by Greg Scott, former Army Corps of Engineers employee. And then, or you can look at a kinematic stereographic approach for stability analysis, which is on the far right. Um, so, on the examples below, on the far left, you can see the um, the vector analysis for strength balancing spreadsheet that a lot of the structural guys use. And then you can see um, here is one of the rigid 3D equilibrium program and the output. And then this is, uh, you know, looking at it visually to apply the loads for 
input. And then these are in the far right are the stereotype progression, progressions, kinematic input, and the different planes of concern. You need to get the loading conditions from the structural analysis to utilize all these programs or approaches. An uncoupled analysis, um, typically you do an uncoupled block stability analysis when the foundation stability is in question, where loading on the block is determined by separate structural analysis, we're using a finite element approach. These are then applied to the block as a force, and a rigid block limit delivery stability analysis is performed. This slide shows how finite element analysis or nest to bus block and our stand. The loading of these elements and the presence of these elements is the total resultant force. And varying earthquake forces would be manipulated in manner of the impact analysis of the And then the ground acceleration calculated at the block can be used to estimate the varying initial forces by multiplying the acceleration of the block method. So you can see uh, the uncoupled analysis on the left. You can include this close in the down far lower left, and then the rigid 3D equilibrium program by Greg Scott, how the forces are dissipated along the slide plane for each wedge and the release plane. And then you can do nonlinear couple analysis, but this is typically only done. If your previous assessment is questionable, but you still think the foundation is all right. So, um, so if you do the previous analysis, but you believe that a couple of analysis after the foundation is actually stable, the load is redistributed and displayed a smaller structural pieces. But the problem is, is this. Nonlinear pulled analysis is very time consuming and expensive and requires a thorough um, exercising and testing of the model to convince the reviewers that the model is behaving properly and the results are reasonable. Um, again, a model is a useful tool. It might not show all the exact, but it, it may take a lot of um, tweaking to get this model to be uh, approved by all the uh, reviewers during this development. But this basically allows um, for stress risk redistribution and allows for interaction between the dam and the foundation at much more smaller increments or finite blocks. Um, 3D, the next slide, we're going to consider uh, 3D components of the foundation. Uh, the shear strength. Um, with two dimensional roughness. To test and evaluate the influence of macroscopic 3D foundation roughness, uh, so basically the asymmetry sliding topography on shear strength under different configurations. So you want to kind of adjust the uh, model to many, well, one with no lateral constraint. Uh, one one sided constraint and two with loose two sided constraint and two with two rigid sided constraint. And you can see the model variations here illustrated for um, the dam illustrated on the far left and then the models and how they were adjusted for these evaluations, these different evaluations to get a, a range of response. And you can see how the different models and rigid constraints respond to the loading level. Next slide is uh, the influence uh, on, of three, three D influences on stability. Um, in developing a conceptual, conceptual or qualitative understanding and characterization of the three dimensionality of the entire dam foundation and failure system is essential in evaluating the stability of the dam foundation. You know, traditional limited equilibrium does not consider the 3D mechanisms between a monolith or with the foundation wedge. 
Um, shear strength of the model is size, i.e. he or she, shear ease or size friction becomes near, nearly as important as the engineering properties as the foundation of your change, sliding resistance, and possibly locking a block in place. Um, potential strengthening influences of the foundation deflection side to side rotation may be significant enough to warrant their explicit participation in design and analysis. Um, the methodology itself can be applied to the study of removable rock waves, agility, um, lateral displacement or deformation. So, if we can develop the 3D asymmetry rotation and all the interlocking between big monoliths within the foundation rock wedge, we can actually properly do an assessment. So many times we just look at an oversimplified view, but uh, if we can take the time to look at that, that, three-dimensionality of things, it may help us understand the slides better. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in summary, uh, most historical concrete dam failures are related to the foundation deficiencies, upward of 50%. The, um, the foundation characterization or the treatment and design, i.e. no drain. The foundation analysis requires understanding the ge geologic, geomechanical, and geotechnical conditions, the rock mass engineering properties, the joint continuity, the wedge shapes, the aperture, roughness, structural loadings, water pressures, and uh, rock mass shear strength. You have to really look at the three-dimensional geologic site characterization as it can be very useful in early risk assessment. Um, you can also look at the foundation analysis method. It should, it should start simple and progress to more complex look. So you can start off with a 2D analysis, but if this is really driving your failure mode, with each progressive risk assessment that gets more complex, your foundation assessment needs to also grow and get complex. Um, you know, you can start off with a conceptual rock model, but then you can basically start modeling it and developing stereographic or cinematic geomechanical evaluations to get a better understanding of the three-dimensional properties, as well as the uh, resistant forces that are comprised of the rock wedge. And then um, you can do uncoupled dam foundation rigid block analysis, and then coupled foundation structural, only when other methods indicate a high likelihood of significant failure. Um, and then the, the final, final summary, um, where kinematic possible failure merits are identified, additional strength and loading and water pressure evaluation data may be needed for the analysis. The event trees can be used to estimate the foundation with sliding risk. If the data is properly understood, and also the you know that's presenting it in a three-dimensional fashion, maybe with stereo nets, but also the three-dimensionality of the water as well. And last of all, the risk assessment should incorporate the most realistic and most likely condition for the analysis but must also consider the geologic uncertainty and possible important variations in regards to the geologic interpretation. Um, I guess the last slide would be questions. That was a lot of information coming down, a real fast fire hose. I know you guys have your space, so um, don't beat me up too much. All right, thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? Yep, we have one. So, uh, curious about the uh, uplift diagram on slide 21, the ones on the far right, and uh, if you had any thoughts there on why it, with the, uh, the pre-drain cleaning uplift. Uh, All right, what, what slide 20, what? Slide 21. Slide 21. Slide 21. Slide 21. Um, which, which illustration? So you have before and after adding drain. The first yeah. one on the left is, is yeah. the one to the uh, the right. 
the right, the next one before and after drain recap? Yeah, right above uh, the page number. Ah, okay, before and after drain rehab here. Um, so what's the question? Why is it shaped like that? The red, red? Yeah, I was just curious about the, the pre-cleaning uh, diagram there, why it dipped at the drains, but then went way up after the drain line. At the, uh, yeah. yeah. It's probably because it's effective shallow in the drain. But not deep. Maybe they're fouling deep, so the pressure is growing at a greater rate downstream at depth. So there is some relief near the drains, but not downstream at depth. Until they're until they're cleaned completely. That also could be due to. Um, I mean, if it's along a, a joint or persistent set of joint features that might get um, backed up. So, since there's a three component of drains, you could also have a cell that's measuring a functioning drain, but the drains that are neighboring it are not functioning. So, you're essentially getting something around that point of the drain. So, the further down three you get, the less effective it's getting. That makes good sense. Yeah, there's also a three dimensionality to this because your row of drains, you know, may not be uh, by fouling or clogging up. Super, thank you. Yep, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it.